right, you all right, and I know who killed JFK. I know you do. <laughs> and uh, I watched uh, Dark Legacy myself. So uh, I was impressed. And I, by that. I, I have a link to that at metrinail.com uh, under your suggestion. Well, okay. Well, you know, it's all it's it's part of a mosaic. The bottom line for me is nobody has a grip on the truth as an individual. But if you have a bunch of people that have pieces of the truth and they can have a civil conversation, then out of that emerges a shared truth. Right. So uh, you mentioned this in the Open Source Everything Manifesto, the, that the more eyes are on something, no bug is invisible. Well, that's – yeah, actually, that's, a, that's a taken from the Linux guys who are the Linux open source guys. And that's their saying that if you put enough eyeballs on it, no bug is invisible. Uh, and I really believe that. And one of the problems that we've had is that both capitalism and democracy have morphed toward a few fat, pasty-faced white guys in a secret room making decisions and basically screwing the rest of us over. And so you and your experience have seen that closed sources of information are leading to bad judgment calls and no, uh, it's, bad it's, decisions. No, it's much, it's much, much worse than that. No, it's worse than that. I Decisions, believe it to be worse than that. Can you explain? It's worse than that. Decisions today are not made on the basis of evidence. They're not made on the basis of sources, whether open or closed. They're made on the basis of selfish interests. Uh, in fact, you know, I never paid much attention to Marxism. Uh, but more recently, with Richard Wolff's book, Occupy the Economy, and Peter Linebaugh's book, Stop Thief, I've started to realize that one of Marx's gifts was that he understood where capitalism was going. And what it boils down to is that the many are the laborers. And they're not just producing labor, they're producing surplus value. And instead of that surplus value going back into their company or back into their community for the benefit of the group, that surplus value is being taken and basically put into a bank account. And the Koch brothers today are getting $3 million an hour in interest on surplus value that they've basically sucked out of the lifeblood of everybody working for them. Um, so when I say it's not about sources, what I'm talking about is about the fact that these people can sit in a closed room and make decisions about how money will be allocated, and like the Keystone Pipeline. The Keystone Pipeline has absolutely nothing to do with the well-being of North America, has absolutely nothing to do with the public interest. It's about sucking tar sands out with fresh water from the aquifer that we can't afford to use. And it's about piping it over to some very old legacy refineries old, owned by some very old rich guys in Texas who are going to export that stuff. They're lying to the public when they say that it's about meeting American domestic needs. American domestic needs peaked. But the problem that we have is that the public isn't very informed. There's an excellent book called Fog Facts, and it's about knowing stuff or stuff that can be known, but it's actually not publicly known. Um, so when I say it's very, very bad, what I really mean is that the people in Washington and the people in New York and, and Texas and elsewhere that are making decisions that are changing the face of this nation, they're making those decisions based on selfish interests. They're not making those decisions based on what we need or what the facts suggest that we should do. But you had suggested that some of these politicians are sheltered and, and not given, not be uh, not being given the information that they need, you know, obviously on purpose through these special interests, but they're being sheltered in a way. It's not just the politicians, it's, it's the rich people, it's also the celebrities. I mean, the reality is that these people have so much money that they end up surrounding themselves with circles of people. And they move in a bubble, and they don't actually see homeless people, and they don't actually see the, the unemployed. Uh, they don't even see dirt in the streets. Uh, they don't see broken water mains. They are literally living on another planet. Uh, and they end up 
in such a way, I mean, Ben Gilad has written a wonderful book called Business Blind Spots, and he's talking about corporate CEOs, but this applies to all of them. He says the information reaching these top people is invariably filtered, biased, late, and inaccurate. Okay? Yeah. And so they they they, they really think that, that they are the masters of the world, and they are in a sense, but they're disconnected from reality. I, I hear you. Now, uh, you mentioned Richard Wolff. He speaks about the uh, benefits of Marxism, and uh, my concern well, is let that me let me correct you. He doesn't speak about the benefits of Marxism. He speaks about the accuracy of Marx's analysis of capitalism. Okay. Now, he had mentioned his concern for the collapse of capitalism and how he thought that Marxism, I guess... Uh, could be a could be coming true, or or that 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 would yeah, have well, to look, fall in place. One of, one of the problems that we have to deal with is that there are words that will make every red blooded American get very angry, and Marxism is one of them. Communism is another. Okay, mm -hmm. the good words are liberty and freedom. Um, right. Okay, uh, what Marx was saying was that capitalism if it did not constantly adapt, would eventually implode. And what he meant by this was that if the workers' productivity was not shared with the workers, if, if all of that surplus value is sucked off and then put into Swiss bank accounts, then eventually what happens is you end up, just like Henry Ford understood that you had to pay workers better so that they could afford to buy his car, you have a closed system in which the workers are not just producers, they're consumers, okay? And what we have done in the United States of America is we have killed not just the middle class, but the blue collar class. Sears is about to go out of business. And someone smarter than me just wrote an excellent article that said that essentially Sears was the middle class, upper blue collar class store. And for Sears to go out of business means we have wiped out an entire essential class in a balanced society. So we're out of balance now. We have the 1% and the 99%. So what I think Wolf is actually saying is that capitalism has failed to adapt. And when I, when I say that, I will point out to you that Lady Lynn Rothschild, who was actually born in New Jersey, but she married a, a British lord. Uh, Lady Rothschild recently had a conference on inclusive capitalism. That's code for stop the pitchforks. Right. The, the people who were at that conference have trillions of dollars under management. And I wrote to her. I never got an answer back. I'm not even sure she saw the letter because she's surrounded by little drones that, you know, decide what she gets to see. Um, for less than 5% of the wealth that the 1% have locked up, for less than 5% of their wealth, I can give every person on this planet an income for life, a free house, clean water, uh, free energy, free internet, and a hydroponics industry that buries the GMOs and pesticides. Okay. Uh, I've heard I've heard your uh, studies about Somalia um, saying that you five hundred dollars each. Yeah, five hundred dollars each. Now I think that that's that there is there's a lot of truth in. In what you're saying, as far as uh, the uh, the elite being concerned about the pitchforks and that sort of thing, but I'm concerned that Richard Wolff doesn't mention that we have a form of fascism and and associates it with capitalism, and I'm afraid that when the crisis occurs, as Peter Schiff and others are. Uh, see it imminently coming with the debt and all like that, that capitalism will be blamed. And when, in fact, we don't have capitalism, we have a corporate fascist. We have fascism. You know, I, I absolutely agree with you. And, and in fact, I've written recently about several world wars that are going on right now. There is a, there's a war going on between fascism and communism. There's a war going on between secular Islam and radical Islam. Um, 
And I think there's a war going on between the 99% and the 1%, which is different from the war between fascism and, and, um, and communism. Um, um, what I will say to you is, is I really love my libertarian friends. In fact, I've been a libertarian. I, I, I have thought of myself as a libertarian in the past. But it's only recently that I've begun to realize that essentially the libertarians have been fed a scam. Because in fact, libertarianism is fascism. Good it's point. about corporate control of the state. And it's about the 1% controlling all property. And so there's a contradiction within libertarianism. Because on the one hand, they want the state to stay out of everything. And they're letting the 1% control all property. And on the other hand, the individuals aren't really allowed to be property owners. They're slave I, wages. I, I, I thought of that yesterday. If uh, I was reading on the ideas of distributism, which was something that was put in place uh, in the Basque country by a yes. uh, uh, father, uh, Jose. I can't pronounce his last name. But distributism sounded, you know, fine, great to me because I, I consider myself a very libertarian. You know, I don't have a problem. I think there's, it's a great idea to have a voluntary, voluntary group of people coming together to form their own corporation and, and benefit from the, uh, the wealth that it grows, them being both owners and, and workers. But I'm, I'm, I'm completely with you, and I'll tell you where I think the distinction is being made by, by Marx and by others, which is that property, property should be community property. It should be held in trust by groups that are physically present. I don't believe that we should allow absentee landlords. I believe that every community needs to own its land and its buildings and its infrastructure and so forth. And we need community banks. I'm a huge fan of Ellen Brown and public banking. Um, and the bottom line here is that an individual has rights. When an individual occupies a space like a, a piece of land or, or a factory or whatever, they have complete and total rights to include the inheritance of their down through their family line, but they don't have the right to do harm to the community. And they don't have the right to sell, for example, their farmland to a foreigner. So that you have to really be thinking about what's good for the community over the next 200 years. And that's not what the Koch brothers and, and their ilk have done. What about taking the land back from the federal government? I think there. Oh yes, I. In fact, I've written about that. If you look at a map of the United States and all of the land that the federal, I don't think the federal government should be allowed to own land. Uh, in fact, uh, the federal government is supposed to be an administrative service of concern. It's not supposed to be uh, King George, and it's not supposed to be a land owner. Um, it's not even supposed to be uh, a dictator of what will and will not be. The states are really supposed to be the preeminent right holders um, representing their individual state populations. So I would absolutely support all states telling the federal government that they are repossessing all land within their borders, period. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I'm a little confused about or i don't agree with necessarily taking forcing people to sell land if they now i that, that i have a problem with that and i i don't know um what you would well, say about one, that. Of the, one of the one of the th i mean this is something that's going to have to be worked out by each individual community okay i, I, re I really want to emphasize to you that the role that i've been playing in the last few years as the number one amazon reviewer for nonfiction is as an aggregator of the ideas of others okay i've been in a search mode and i've been pulling in ideas and thoughts from others and i've been aggregating them and i've been disseminating them so i really want to emphasize i'm not putting myself in a position where i'm saying i have the answer or any answer Rather, I'm more of a facilitator of what should be a local to national conversation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, as far as forcing people to sell, let me make a couple of points. 
The first is that I believe that the banks have so thoroughly screwed both individual homeowners and communities. They, the banks have more than made back all of their money. <laughs> That's a great point. They own everything anyway. Well, now, wait a minute. They have already been paid many times over for what they have been touching. Yeah. So that if you took it away from them through eminent domain or through citizen populist seizure, they haven't actually lost it because they have harvested the profits from that property so many times over that if you were a righteous person and you had all the facts on the table, you would say, hey, wait a minute, not only do you not own this land, but you owe us half our money back. 